kind introduction. So Thank today you. I'll be talking about designing advanced battery materials beyond lithium-ion technology. So as we move towards a sustainable energy future, we'll be using more of intermittent renewable energy. As a result, we will need advanced energy storage systems that can store this excess renewable energy and then release them on demand to power our electric vehicles, homes, industries, etc. And lithium ion batteries, they have been a great invention and they are our mainstream technology for the past few decades. However, lithium ion te technology has remained relatively stagnant over the years because such batteries are reaching the theoretical limit of what they can achieve. And therefore, we need to explore new battery chemistries that can deliver higher energy densities at a much lower cost while maintaining high safety standards at the same time. And therefore, our group focuses on batteries that are beyond lithium ion technology, and this includes sodium, magnesium, aluminum ion batteries. And these batteries have very different chemistries and operating mechanisms compared to um, lithium ion technology. For example, while lithium and sodium are monovalent ions with a plus one charge, Magnesium is a divalent ion with a plus two charge. And aluminum is a trivalent ion with a plus three charge. So we may ask, what are the advantages of such batteries? First, we see that sodium, magnesium, and aluminum sulfur batteries, they offer much higher energy densities than lithium ion batteries today that are based on NMC111 cathode and graphite anode. So why is that so? Let's take magnesium as an example. Magnesium is a divalent ion with a plus two charge, twice the charge of lithium. But in fact, both magnesium and lithium have very similar ionic radius. As a result, magnesium has twice the charge capacity per volume compared to lithium. And this in turn translates to higher energy density. And moreover, lithium is relatively expensive and scarce in the Earth's crust, whereas sodium, magnesium, aluminum, they are much cheaper and more abundant. And this in turn translates to lower material costs for batteries. And so it is in fact this combination of high energy density and low cost that makes these metal sulfur batteries promising for next generation applications. So let's take a look at the case study of sodium sulfur batteries as an example. So room temperature sodium sulfur batteries, they face multiple challenges on the anode, electrolyte, and the cathode. On the anode side, as you see on the left, sodium tends to form dendrites, which can short circuit the battery. And these dendrites even destroy the solid electrolyte interface or the so-called SEI, which makes it unstable. On the cathode side, on the right, sulfur not only has low electronic conductivity, it undergoes a 170% volumetric expansion upon sodiation, and this leads to pulverization and structural change in the electrode. Moreover, sulfur forms these reaction intermediates known as sodium polysulfides, which dissolve into the electrolyte during cycling, as you can see in the middle, and this leads to loss of active material during cycling. All these factors combined result in fast capacity decay and short cycle life in sodium sulfur batteries. And therefore, to address these problems simultaneously, a multifaceted approach is needed. Addressing problems on the anode, electrolyte, and the cathode side. Let's first take a look at the sodium anode. In general, it is important to form a stable interface on the sodium anode to protect it. Typically, researchers have been using monophasic inorganic interfaces such as sodium halides, which have very high stiffness or Young's modulus to suppress dendrite growth at low current densities. However, as you see on the schematic on the right, at the high current densities, such anodes are unable to cycle very well because the growth mode of sodium switches from equilibrium to non-equilibrium growth. And because of the large volume change that is involved at high current density, it is important to have an interface with ductile properties to accommodate this volume change. And therefore, to combine both properties together, 
we designed a biphasic interface combining both stiff and ductile properties in order to handle cycling at both low and high current densities for sodium anodes. So in this work, we designed a biphasic interface or so called BPI using a facile one-step solid vapor reaction by reacting sodium with ammonia water to form sodium hydroxide and sodium amide at the same time. From the equations, you can see that sodium will react with water to form sodium hydroxide and reacts with ammonia as well to form sodium amide. And from our DFT calculations on the right, we know that sodium hydroxide is a much stiffer material with a high Young's modulus about 31 gigapascals, whereas sodium amide is a more ductile material with higher critical strain of 56%. So the combination of both of them is potentially synergistic. Further characterization of the interface using SEM and XRD tells us that the BPI is about 3 micrometer thick. And this thickness can be adjusted by tuning the um, reaction time. And this BPI consists of two chemically distinct phases, sodium hydroxide and sodium amide, as seen from the XRD. And these are uniformly distributed in the interface. And one of the main criteria for an effective interface is high ionic conductivity. So here we use EIS impedance to measure the charge transfer resistance at various temperatures. And we fitted the curves using the VFT equation to obtain an Arrhenius-like plot, as you see on the top right. From the slope of the plot, we can see that the BPI has a much lower activation barrier for charge transfer of about 0.06 electron volts, compared to pristine sodium, which is about 0.25 electron volts. In this lower diffusion barrier is also supported by DFT calculations on the bottom row, which show that sodium diffuses fast within the sodium hydroxide and the sodium amide lattice, with relatively low diffusion barriers. Another important criteria is non-dendritic growth of sodium, which ensures safety of the battery. Recently, cryogenic TEM has been used to study lithium dendrites because lithium is highly reactive and beam sensitive. Here we use cryogenic TEM to study sodium dendrites for the first time, to preserve their morphology. As you can see on the top row, for pristine sodium without any interface, sodium dendrites grow uncontrollably. The primary growth direction is along the 002 bar direction, which can be attributed to the relatively low surface energy along this direction. On the other hand, on the bottom row, in a case of sodium protected by BPI, sodium goes uniformly without dendritic features, and this shows that the BPI is effective in suppressing dendrite growth. More importantly, the sodium anode with BPI is able to cycle at both low and high current densities from 1 milliamps up to 50 milliamps per square centimeter for over 500 cycles. So as you see on the benchmarking figure on the right, previous attempts have been limited mostly to 1 milliamp per square centimeter with a couple of demonstrations at 3 and 5 milliamp per square centimeter. So this stability of sodium anode at 50 milliamps per square centimeter demonstrated here is unprecedented. Next, we also compare the cycling performance of the BPI with that of the monophasic interfaces, that is sodium hydroxide and sodium amide only. So these two form using the same solid vapor reaction by reacting sodium with water vapor and dry ammonia respectively. And we see that the monophase interfaces do not cycle as well as the BPI. With, they show much shorter cycle life. And this again confirms successful design of the BPI. Next, we assemble full cell sodium sulfur batteries. Using the BPI protected anode, the sodium sulfur battery at room temperature is able to cycle stably with high specific capacities ranging from 500 to 900 milliamp hours per gram. And this is over 500 cycles at 0.5 C. And the low capacity decay of about 0.09% per cycle is among the best cycling performance for room temperature sodium sulfur batteries so far. On the other hand, as you can see, for the black curve, the sodium sulfur battery with pristine sodium anode short circuits within about 100 cycles or so 
and this shows very poor reversibility and dendrite growth. And this is our next work published in Energy Storage Materials where we also extended our idea of a BPI to another material system, a metal alloy interface, also called MAI. Here we performed a solid vapor reaction of sodium with tin chloride vapors. In this reaction, sodium reacts with tin chloride, SNCl4, to form tin and sodium chloride, and tin in turn alloys with sodium to form a sodium tin alloy. And XRD shows that the interface formed on the sodium anode is six micrometer thick. And again, this thickness can be tuned using uh, controlling the reaction time. And this anode interface comprises both a sodium tin alloy, Na1.17 SN2, as well as sodium chloride. So it is in essence a biphasic interface as well. This MAI is again studied using EIS to evaluate its charge transfer kinetics. So we see that the sodium anode with MAI exhibits much smaller charge transfer resistance compared to pristine sodium, indicating fast ion diffusion. This is seen by the smaller semicircle in the EIS spectrum. And in fact, we also performed DFT calculations and we found that sodium 1.17 SN2 has intrinsic partial sodium vacancy defects within its structure. And there is very low sodium diffusion barrier of 0.11 electron volt, especially along the path six to four prime. And this is facilitated by the presence of sodium vacancy defects, leading to less sodium-sodium repulsion. And cryogenic TEM was used to study the sodium anodes showing dendritic growth in the case of pristine sodium and non-dendritic growth in the case of MEI protected sodium. And the sodium ended with MEI is able to cycle stably at various current densities up to seven milliamps per square centimeter, whereas pristine sodium showed obvious instabilities. To understand the underlying reasons behind instability, we study the SEI that's formed after cycling, using XPS depth profiling, we find that the MEI sodium is highly compact and contains very little organic reduction products. It's mainly made of inorganic sodium oxide and sodium chloride with very low permeability for electrolyte solvent. On the other hand, the SEI on pristine sodium contains a mix of organic and inorganic products formed from the reduction of electrolyte salt and solvent. And this shows that the SCI is highly permeable and hence less stable during cycling. Using the MAI protected anode, the sodium sulfur battery is able to cycle stably with high specific capacities of about 500 to 1100 milliamp hours per gram over 500 cycles at 0.5 C the average Columbia efficiency is measured to be about 99.7% close to unity. The battery is also able to withstand high C rate up to 4C with a specific capacity of about 400 milliamp hours per gram, showing high rate capability and fast reaction kinetics. Now let's return to our schematic of a sustainable energy future. Batteries, as we discussed earlier, can be used to power light duty transportation, such as cars and buses. However, when we are talking about heavy duty transport, like trucks, ships, airplanes, these are very difficult to power using batteries because the energy and power density required is just way too large. Therefore, another focus of my group is to develop electrocatalysts that can convert water and carbon dioxide into useful fuels such as hydrogen and methanol, which we can use to power heavy duty transportation. In particular, molecular hydrogen is very promising fuel for the future because it has a very high energy density by mass, higher than fossil fuels. And to realize this vision, 
we need to develop active and of abundant electrocatalysts for the hydrogen evolution reaction, or the HGR. And we see in this volcano plot on the top left that platinum is well known to be the most active precious metal catalyst for the HGR. But because of its high cost and scarcity, extensive work has been focused on non-precious metal catalysts such as MOS2, which is a 2D layer material that shows good HGR activity. However, one of the challenges is that only the edge sites of MOS2 are primarily active and the basal planes are largely inactive. And this requires a lot of complex material design, as you can see on the bottom row, ranging from double gyroid morphology to vertical line structures just to expose more edge sites. And therefore, our motivation is how do we develop 2D materials with active basal planes so that we can maximize the number of active sites. And so with this motivation, we were the first to study 2D transition metal carbides and nitrites, also known as vaccines, as electrocatalysts for HER. And these materials were found to have basal planes that are active towards HER, making them very promising. To give you a short introduction of vaccines, these are basically 2D layered transition metal carbides and nitrites that can take on different structures, M2X, M3X2, M4X3, where M is the transition metal, X is carbon or nitrogen. For example, Ti2C, as you see here, will consist of two layers of titanium sandwiching a layer of carbon. And because the titanium atoms are under-coordinated, vaccines have surface functional groups such as F, or oxygen, fluorine or oxygen, which are known as TX, the basal plane terminations. And because catalysis takes place on the surface of catalysts, the basal plane terminations are expected to have a profound effect on HR activity. And therefore, there are two main questions that need to be answered here. One, what is the effect of different basal plane terminations on HR activity? And two, which vaccine among all of these candidates here has the highest HGR activity. To answer the first question, we start off by investigating Ti3C2 vaccines. This vaccine can be synthesized from its parent max phase, Ti3 aluminum C2, by etching the aluminum atoms, followed by sonication, we can synthesize layered vaccines with fluorine and oxygen atoms on the basal plane. And more importantly, by using different actions, we can control the basal plane terminations. For example, 50% HF is stronger than 10% HF and LIFHCl, and therefore 50% HF is expected to produce more fluorine groups on the surface compared to the other two actions. And after synthesizing the vaccines, we use XPS to characterize them and estimate the fluorine to titanium ratio. So as, ex as expected, the vaccine form using 50% HF has the highest fluorine to titanium ratio, followed by 10% HF and then LIF HCl. We proceeded to investigate their HCl activity in 0.5 molar sulfuric acid and found an interesting trend. The LIFHCl sample showed the lowest overpotential, followed by 10% HF, and then the worst is 50% HF. So in fact, the higher the fluorine to titanium ratio, the lower the HR activity. And this leads us to hypothesize that the presence of fluorine groups on the basal plane actually suppresses HR activity. And to confirm this hypothesis, we carried out these DFT calculations on these vaccines, where TX is a combination of oxygen and fluorine atoms. So we start off with all oxygen covered and then slowly replace oxygen atoms with fluorine. And we found that the higher the fluorine to titanium ratio, the larger the overpotential, as you can see on the plot here, the black line. 
In fact, we found that when the surface is actually fully covered with oxygen, the hydrogen H star actually binds favorably to the surface. But when the surface is covered with fluorine, hydrogen binds very weakly. And therefore, it has, rare dif it has difficulty in, in the first adsorption step. And this leads in turn to lower HR activity. And when we overlay our experimental HR curve, as you see on the red line, we find that it is quite consistent with the general theoretical train as well. Now, the second question is, which vaccine among all the candidates has one of the highest HR activity? Because of the huge pool of candidates, we turn to DFT calculations to perform high throughput screening of promising vaccine catalysts, considering about 20 different vaccines, to determine their most um, favorable surface functional groups using Tor Bay diagrams. And here we focus on oxygen based groups because fluorine groups are known to suppress H activity. And from there, we can calculate their delta GH, the Gibbs free energy of hydrogen adsorption. It is known to be a good descriptor of HR activity. And these results can be summarized in the form of a volcano plot, where catalysts at the top of the volcano show the lowest over potential and highest HR activity. Based on the Sabata principle, we know that an optimal HR catalyst should bind hydrogen neither too strongly nor too weakly, with delta GH close to zero. And so when we zoom to the top of the volcano, we can identify molybdenum carbide as a promising HR catalyst with a very small delta GH of 0.048 electron volts. The next step is to synthesize MO2C with low fluorine content. To do so, we started off with molybdenum gallium carbide, etched away the gallium atoms and we formed the vaccine. By using very mild etching conditions, we are able to synthesize MO2C with very low fluorine content with F to MO of 0 0.02, which tells us that the basal planes are largely covered with oxygen atoms. MO2C was found to be an active HR catalyst in acid achieving about 10 milliamp per square centimeter at 189 millivolt over potential. This is much better than MOS2 of similar morphology, which shows almost no activity in the same potential range. Moreover, it's very stable even after 1000 CV cycles and 120 minutes of coronal potentiometry. We also analyzed the molybdenum XPS spectrum before and after HER and we found that the doublets of the MO2, the doublets of the MOC species are relatively unchanged, which explains its high stability. And next, more importantly, we seek to confirm that the uh, basal planes of MO2C are in fact the active planes towards HGR. So we perform three experiments here. First, we compare the HR activity of MO2C with molybdenum gallium carbide. These two materials are quite similar, except that the MO gallium carbide has gallium atoms, whereas the molybdenum carbide has just oxygen atoms on the basal plane. And we found that the MO gallium carbide shows much poorer HR activity compared to molybdenum carbide, which suggests to us that the oxygen atoms on the basal plane of MO2C are in fact active towards HGR. And next, we compare the HR activity of multi-layer MO2C with that of the delaminated form. And as you know, delamination exposes more basal planes. There was a three-time increase in the electrochemical active surface area, ECSA, as measured by impedance. And as expected from the CV curves, delaminated MO2C shows higher HR activity compared to the multi-layered form. And this indicates that the basal planes are in fact active towards HGR. We also performed another experiment, the last one here, where we ultrasonicated MO2C to damage the basal planes deliberately. As you can see on the markings in red. 
The crystal structure and lattice spacing of MO2C are still preserved, as seen from the SAED pattern. And we found that the ultrasonicated samples with damaged basal planes they show much worse HR activity, which further confirms that the basal planes are in fact active. So as a conclusion, we see that Maxine's are actually very active towards HR. And in this case, we have only explored one type of Maxine, and there are many others waiting to be explored, including in our group. And this is currently a very active area of research in many parts of the world as well. So it is hoped that with more exploration of these different vaccine catalysts and further tuning of surface functional groups, we can actually optimize their performance towards HDR and also towards other emerging reactions, such as CO2 reduction, nitrogen reduction, etc. And this will hopefully, together with batteries, bring us towards a more sustainable energy future. So with that, I would like to thank all my team members for their hard work. And that includes Alex, Dan Tien, Vipin, Wang Yong, Li Bing, Garrick, Danny, Yen Wei, and Raymond. And I would like also to thank ASTAR, as well as NRF and TU for their funding support. And of course, if you happen to visit Singapore and ASTAR, feel free to let me know as well. And I'll be happy to show you around our lab and our research group. And of course, we are very open to collaborations as well. And so with that, thank you so much for your attention.